Well folks, welcome back to another video. A little more playing around in the shop as I mentioned last time. I did find another lathe languishing in a barn. This is kind of how I found it. It's covered in a white powdery stuff. I'm not sure what it was. I know it was in a woodworking shop, but it didn't quite look like sawdust. But as I started taking it apart and seeing what was going on, when I got the apron off, the one thing, one, the only problem I found so far is a broken tooth on the gear that runs along the rack, the pinion gear that runs along. Here's the rest of the apron parts after they've been evapo rusted and cleaned up and ready to go back together. So here's the broken tooth. Um, I've never repaired a gear tooth and I've never done any silicon bond bronze brazing, but I have watched Keith Fenner and uh, Keith Rucker's videos on it. So while not an expert, at least I have some exposure. So I thought, you know, this is a good chance. If I can't get it to work, I thought what I could do would be to turn off all the teeth and then make a make a new gear and press it on over that. There's not a lot of meat there. So I decided I'd start out with trying the uh, brazing. So first off, I tried to uh, use a use the Dremel to and a carbide burr to, to get in there and get out the broken tooth. That didn't work so well. So then I went the Keith Fenner route and got the angle grinder and uh, tried to get rid of the, <clears throat> the broken tooth with the grinder, and that worked. That worked pretty well. There was a there was a little bit left over after I got done playing with the grinder that I had to uh, go back in and clean up with the Dremel and the carbide. But uh, the <clears throat> grinder did, did a good job of getting the remains of that tooth out. So like I said, I did go in and kind of clean up the edge a little bit with the Dremel. But it would have taken forever to do the whole thing with the Dremel. So what I tried to do was get it down to where it kind of looked like the one that Keith Fenner had done. Okay dug it down so there was some place for that uh, the silicon bronze to sit in there now as I said I haven't ever used silicon bronze but I have I have done oxyacetylene welding so I thought how hard can it be turns out it wasn't that hard I was I was pretty happy with the way it went and uh, the results I got um, I did put a pretty good preheat on the part um, it's been a good good amount of time going over it uh, just checking the temperature with one of the temple temperature sticks um, I didn't obviously show all the heating that I did but I did get the part up to uh, I think that was a 400 degree temple stick and so once we got the part heated up I realized the flux won't stick to the silicon bronze rod unless it's hot so to heat up the brazing rod a little bit to get this flux to stick and then just start piling it in and um, just, like I said it seemed to go, go pretty good and I was pretty happy with the results it was uh, not quite as hard as I was expecting as I watched the video I realized that I need to clean the tip on that torch it just kind of has a little funny flame coming off it but didn't notice that when I was using it but yeah I just spent some time trying to build up that puddle of silicon bronze to fill in the gap between the the two good teeth where that broken tooth had been and uh, you know I was trying to get it up to the right height so it was taller than the remaining teeth and uh, after getting it done I I just went ahead and uh, covered the part over with the the uh, fiberglass welding blanket and let it cool down for the rest of the afternoon I wanted to cool it nice and slow those fire bricks had gotten plenty hot during the uh, preheat and the welding too so I thought that it give it a good cool down so after letting it cool down for the rest of the afternoon till it was 
cool enough to pick up. I was able to take a look at it. And looks like I got enough on there. So now I had to get the part in the lathe where I could uh, turn off, turn it back down to the proper diameter for the gear. Uh, getting it lined up in the lathe turned out to be a little bit tricky. I cut out about uh, maybe an hour of video of trying to get this part in the lathe. And I tried several different, several different methods. To, right now I've got the coaxial indicator in the bore and then an indicator on the outside. Um, you know, it took a while to get it in, but uh, I did finally get it in. I just skipped you the torture of watching me trying to figure out how to do it, and um, I started turning down the OD. Well, first I faced it off to get the what had come over onto that thrust face. I guess it's not really a thrust face; it just rides on the end of the shaft. But uh, get that turned down, and then. Uh, I started working on getting the OD cut down to the right size. The hard part with holding that gear is the the big gear that's up in the chuck doesn't run true to the bore. It's kind of I don't, I'm not sure how it, you know this the lathe was built in 1910. I'm not sure how it was machined, but it doesn't quite run true. You know, it, it is just the carriage feed, so it's not like it's high speed application by any stretch. So. I'm sure it works fine. It was just hard to get it to hold it and get it to run true with the bore. So here we've got it uh, turned down to the OD. You can see I'm just starting to kiss the top of the teeth there. So, And I had to come in around the back to try and turn down the braze that it got down on past, in past the gear. Put an indicator on the, it's just touching the back of the tool post. I think uh, that's what Keith Fenner called the dashboard gauge. It's a handy trick in there. Because then I could go in and touch the center of the bore and then back it off and get back in. So then I found a high speed steel tool with a radius on it. Or, yeah, with a radius on the end that I could go in and kind of clean up the very the back edge of the teeth. Just kind of went in there and cleaned off the braze as well as the a lot of the flux had uh, kind of run down around that part of the part had to get I guess it didn't have to come off but I wanted to get it cleaned up a little bit better so when I hadn't turned off the the braze coming up to the back of the teeth Then gave it a quick uh, hit with some uh, emery cloth to just clean up the what was left of the flux. And uh, we'll take a look at the part and see if it looks like it's ready to go. So now we've got the the brazing all turned down. Got a little bit, you can see a little bit of some little voids right around the, the edges where they go onto the, the good teeth on either side, but should be plenty good for what, what it's going to be doing. So after getting the brazing turned down, then I had to make an arbor to mount the to mount the uh, blank in the on the lathe here I'm just after I made the arbor I just put it in to see how true the the center drill hole on the end was running and it looked like it was running pretty good so decided to go with it you can kind of see the wobble in that gear the big gear but the bore and the pinion gear are running true so Anyway, just a little arbor with a, some threads and a sleeve to to uh, hold it in the dividing head. Then I realized I also needed some way to hold my gear cutter, so I had a piece of little piece of 12L14. Thought 
I should be able to do something to make that work. So just a little center drill on the end, and then uh, drilled it out and tapped it for a, uh, a bolt that I made for a, another cutter. I didn't want to have to make a, another new bolt, so I just went ahead and tapped this out for the same size. It was a, I think it was 7 16. Could be wrong. Definitely need to get a tap holder for the for the tailstock. The chucks just can't get a can't get a bite on that. On that. The taps are so hard that the chuck won't bite into them and hold them. So one of these days, that's another project. Tap holder. So here's the here's the bolt that I'd made for some other project. I I think it's kind of I can't remember if Stefan Gottsvinter or somebody showed how to make that kind of a thing. But I needed a, something that sat up fairly flush, and I don't have a rotary brooch for putting those nice hexes in like Stefan and a lot of guys have made lately. Maybe that's a project down the road. But I'd made this wrench a while back. Uh, it's got two different can do two different sizes for a couple different bolts that I've made over the last little while but uh, that end that I was showing there I tried to forge over the ends in that uh, Keith Record showed a video where he made a little die and then forged over the ends of the bar like that turns out you can't do that if I was using mystery metal but it turns out it's tool steel and uh, once you get it red hot and start beating it into a form that uh, makes it pretty brittle and it failed pretty quickly. So after I threaded the one end I just flipped around the piece, faced it off, and uh, turned it down to the right diameter to fit in a collet in the mill. I think I I think I went with three quarter inch diameter to fit in a three quarter collet on the mill. As you can see, I started running higher uh, feed rates on, on the lathe, trying to, and getting a lot better chip control. If you watch some of my earlier videos, you know, remember those bird nests, giant bird nests I was getting. And scary and dangerous, and um, it's a lot nicer to get those little, little bitty chips breaking up. So, after uh, turning it down, I just kind of polished it up a little bit to get it to the final size. I think I ended up about a half a thousand bigger than I wanted, but polished it down until it fit in the three-quarter collet. And uh, then we're ready to go. So just a little, a uh, little arbor to hold that uh, gear cutter. Now I wanted it to run as concentric as I could get it. So what I did is went ahead and put it in the collet on the milling machine and uh, turned the shoulder that the gear cutter will sit on down on the milling machine. That way I figured it would be running concentric. Uh, but you gotta put the lathe tool in the vise the right way instead of the wrong way in order to get that to work. Now that we've got the tool facing the right way, I just went ahead and faced off the bottom and uh, turned that shoulder down. It's a little, not as much uh, less convenient as doing it on the lathe because you can't see what you're doing as well. Didn't wasn't as I guess if you did it all the time it would become comfortable, but uh, far more comfortable. In operations like this in the lathe, and probably would have been good enough to do it in the lathe, but I don't know. Thought this might be a good, good way to make sure that tool ran, the cutter in the ran concentric. So here I'm using a disc micrometer. It was a regular micrometer was hard to get onto the little shoulder since it's such a. There's only a couple hundred. I think it was two hundred thousand. So the disc micrometers are nice. I 
the first time I saw that was on a, a Stefan Gotts Venter video. So I got on eBay and found a little Starrett disc mic for pretty cheap. And uh, it's been handy. There's a lot of places where it's really, really handy. Just a close up of the turning operations on the milling machine. Just feeding, using the power feed in the Z so that feeding the knee up nicely about the Curdian Trekker, you do have power feeds in all X, Y, and Z running the spindle at about 500 RPM. Just took a little emery cloth to clean up the OD, make it look pretty anyway. And then uh, try to test fit in that cutter on. A real nice fit. This way and then uh, threading on the bolt to hold it on. And then after getting it uh, tightened on, to see how well it had run. Sorry for the shaky camera, but just wanted to get it down there where you could see the that gear cutter. And uh, how it was running. I was pretty happy with the that little arbor. It looks like it's running true and uh, should do the job. So here's a clip of the cutter. Turned out nice. And should do the job. So here I'm just showing, these are some covers I made for to cover the table. I got so tired of cleaning out the T-slots, I just had some plastic laying around and uh, uh, took an end mill and cut some little holes and put some uh, just some ma little magnets, rare earth magnets from the hobby store, Hobby Lobby, I think it was, and uh, just drop them on there when I'm not using it. I built this little roll around cart that, so I could, because that dividing head is not something you want to lift by yourself. It's it's a Kearney and Trekker, but it's a Model K. I found it on the local classifieds for a real reasonable price. And, so I picked it up, but it's the size bigger than my mill. My mill's an HL, a 2HL, and that's a K head for the K size mills. But, you know, you just take what you can find when you're buying it used. And it uh, came with a tailstock, which is actually a Cincinnati tailstock. And it came with that buck uh, true adjust uh, three jaw chuck. So I was pretty happy to get it. But that car allows me to put the rotary table and the dividing head and whatnot on the mill without having to lift them. So just an idea, one, I, one good idea I came up with. I do have some bigger casters to put on it because once I got all the tooling on it, it doesn't move around very well with cheap Barber Freight casters. Now another hour or so of work that's been condensed down of trying, I got a, a shaft in the dividing head the tailstock and I'm just trying to get it to run true and uh, uh, get the dividing head and the tailstock lined up so everything is running parallel to the table and again there was a lot of time involved we got a, a DTI in the quill and then the test indicator uh, down on the knee trying to make sure everything's running parallel in both directions. So again, saved you quite a bit of time watching me fuss with it, trying to figure out try to figure out how to do it. But that's what I ended up doing, the way I ended up doing it. So once we get the uh, parts bolted down to the table I had to figure out how thick the how thick the uh, cutter was. And then um, Keith Fenner had showed this trick where you put a parallel on top of the cutter and then just kind of sweep until you can feel the top of the, the part you're trying to line up with and just, just get the diameter of the part and thickness of the cutter and 
little bit of quick math and you can figure out where the center line is. Um, and I did put the, uh, I do have a digital readout now on the quill of the lathe. That's another video that I'm working on getting together is getting, putting a digital readout on the, on the quill. Again, I'm just sweeping to feel the top of the, top of the part and you can feel when it starts to drag. So then I mount, then I got it all set up on the front side. Then I thought the cutter was turning the wrong direction because I wanted it to be cutting towards the chuck. So I moved it, got it all lined up on the back side. Then I realized I had had it right the first time. So I moved the cutter back to the to the front side. I used a hold a hold down from the, the in the T slot there as a stop for the power feed. I wanted to make sure I didn't feed into the gear. So now I've got it all set up and cutting. So I had to cut I had a little bit of overflow into the teeth on either side of the broken tooth. So I started out test just testing to cut those clean up that teeth tooth and just get rid of the braids that had kind of flowed over into the valley there between the two teeth so i'm using the power feed I had the power feed set pretty slow um i, running, I think i was running a half inch a minute you can see the the stop kicks out when it feeds over and that way i didn't have to worry about running it far enough, run it too far into the, hit the main, the big gear there. So then it was just a matter of feeding in, taking the cut, it was going in a hundred thousandths, and then here I'm rotating the dividing head into the, into the uh, one side of the new tooth. Again, I was taking about a hundred thousandths a cut. I set the tool up between some of the existing good teeth and then set my dial indicator so I knew where, how far into feed to get to the, you know, to the root of the tooth. And there's just a sped up clip of the process. I suppose I could break it have gone a lot faster, but it was a little bit nervous the first time I've ever tried anything like this so I thought I might as well take my time and hopefully not screw it up too bad but after a couple passes got the tooth to depth and uh, rotate it and finish it up so here's the finished product just getting the arbor off here But uh, I was real happy with how things turned out. Like I said, I wasn't my wasn't really cutting a whole gear, but I did get that tooth cut in. There's a little bit of braise. Now that I look at them, I kind of wish I'd braised up the whole thing and recut all the teeth because there's quite a bit of wear. I mean, after a hundred years of this lathe being run, there is a fair bit of wear. So if I do notice it being a problem when I get it all back together, I think I'll just braise the whole thing up and recut all the teeth. So there's the final tooth and one more project done and we'll keep working on this old lathe and see if we can get it up and running. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.